Imagine that you walk into a room. The temperature of the room is maybe 15, 16, 16 and a half degrees. It doesn't really make a difference to you, right? It's quite chilly for a room. But like just half a degree of centigrade, half a degree of temperature change makes a big difference for our world. It makes a big difference for our future. That's why I'm here today. I'd like to talk to you about half a degree of warming and about our capacity to actually deal with the consequences. Just for the record, it's now well established by science that climate change is real. The Earth's temperatures are rising, they're rising quickly. It's because of human activities and the consequences are dire. But just how dire those consequences will be was not precisely known until recently. About one and a half year ago, about a hundred experts, including myself, worked for the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on a report on the consequences of global warming of one and a half degrees centigrade. Now, you might wonder why one and a half degrees? Well, there's a story here. You may also know that in December 2015 in Paris, the world leaders gathered to agree among each other what to do about climate change. So all the world leaders, all the country leaders came together and talked about climate change. That's actually quite, quite special. And what's even more special is that they managed to agree on something. They agreed on the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement says that we should jointly keep temperature rise to well below 2 degrees centigrade and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees. So there's not really a target in there, right? They said well below 2 or 1.5. And, and they didn't really know what the difference would be. So they asked the scientists to give them some answers. So that's what we worked on for the past year and a half. And it was quite a lot of work, actually. We finished the report last month, October 2018, and I'm going to tell you something about the conclusions. I will start with the bad news and hopefully end with some good news. So the first conclusion was that we are already at one degree warmer. The Earth is already one degree centigrade warmer than before we started emitting lots of greenhouse gases. And we are feeling the consequences. In the Netherlands, we had a nice and long and very sunny summer. But other people have not been so lucky. We had devastating forest fires in California very recently. We had tremendous floods in southern India, which cost hundreds of lives. We've seen droughts in southern Africa, unprecedented hurricanes in North America. As it was so hot in the Netherlands last summer, I was sitting at home and I was thinking to myself, it has really started. It is now upon us. And it was chilling, frankly, despite the heat. Another conclusion of the IPCC report is what exactly is the difference between one and a half and two degrees? And also there we have some pretty strong conclusions. It makes a huge difference. It's essentially the difference between manageable disaster and outright catastrophe. For instance, the world's coral reefs, they're quite pretty to look at. But it's not just pretty that they are, they actually support the life of many, many people around the world. Not just for their food, in the food systems that they provide, but also for their income, because of tourism, for instance. The IPCC report concluded that at two degrees of warming, all coral reefs in the world will disappear completely. We will not see them anymore. At one and a half degrees, at least some of them would be left. So that's some good news. Another example, sea level rise. We're here in Amsterdam, already a few meters below sea level, so we're kind of used to it. 
In a two-degree scenario, the sea level would, in the year 2100, be 10 centimeters higher than in a one and a half degree scenario, and in the longer run, this difference would be, would be much bigger. So 10 centimeters, about this much. It doesn't really look like much, but if you're a water manager here in the Netherlands, you know it makes a difference. And if you live in a Pacific atoll, like the people on the picture right here in the nation of Tuvalu, you know it makes a big difference. Actually, for them, it's the difference between having a country and not having a country at all. I can go on with the consequences. Stronger hurricanes, an ice-free Arctic every 100 years in a two-degree scenario, every 10 years, or every 10 years in a two-degree scenario, every 100 years in a one-and-a-half-degree scenario. More forest fires, more droughts, extinction of species, probably a vast increase in the amount of displaced people because parts of the world would become uninhabitable. And that will cause a lot of refugees. What we've seen so far might just be the start. Fortunately, there are also some positive conclusions in the IPCC report. There is still hope. We can still keep temperature rise below 1.5 C. We can still do it. We haven't crossed the threshold. We have to agree on very big changes, and we have to do them right now. By 2050, in 30 years, we would have to reduce our CO2 emissions to zero, globally, not just in a developed country, globally. And this will require lots of changes in the way we live. But in a way, it's also a good thing, because at least we still have something to choose. If we decide for one and a half degrees and changing our lives to do this, and it's quite imaginable to live well uh, in a 1.5 C consistent way, at least we will avoid a lot of the chaos that we would be uh, calling upon ourselves if we go to two degrees or even more, which is what we're bound to right now. So we can still choose the future that we want. So the IPCC basically summarized three things. First, we're already at one degree warming, and if we continue at the same pace, we will exceed one and a half degrees by about 2040. So in 20 years from now, we will, most of us will live to see that, and our children certainly will. The dif secondly, the difference between one and a half and two degrees is huge in terms of impact. Every little bit of warming matters. And thirdly, we can still limit warming by the end of the century to one and a half degrees. We can still avoid all these consequences. So it seems to make a lot of sense to take action. Right? And you've probably all heard what you can do. It's all over the news all the time. You can eat less meat and use less dairy. You can uh, transport yourself by bicycle, electric vehicles, more public transport. Uh, you should probably insulate your house and make them hyper-efficient. Uh, source your energy from low-carbon sources, solar, wind, potentially nuclear energy. And we should clean up our industries to make our products low-carbon. And I'd really like to tell you to do all these things, and you should. But there's still a bit of a problem here. I don't know if you ever try to renovate your house in a low-carbon way. I did, and it's actually quite hard. Where do you get the low-carbon building materials? Which steel company is producing low-carbon steel? Technically, it's possible. It's not happening. If you want to cycle everywhere, here in Amsterdam, that's probably very possible. But in many places of the world, the infrastructure just isn't there. It's not safe to cycle everywhere, or it's frowned upon, it's looked down on culturally. If we want to limit warming to one and a half degrees, we need to change the systems that we live in as well. And in order to do that, we need policy, we need a change in finance, and we need a different direction of technological innovation. But there's one thing that I would really like to emphasize something that is generally a bit underestimated, that is not talked about so much. And that is capacity. Do we actually have the capacity, the human skills, the education systems, the skills of our entrepreneurs and our, and our workers, of our civil servants, to actually make this change? I don't think we have. We need a much bigger set and spread, a global spread of capacity, in order to make this happen. I'll illustrate this with an example. The country of Indonesia. 
It's a big country, 250 million people, even more by now. It had a pretty steady economic growth. It's actually quite, going quite well with Indonesia, 5% per year uh, or so over the past 10 to 15 years. And it's, although there's still widespread poverty in Indonesia, there's also a rising middle class. A lot of people are leading a much more high-quality life. They're buying cars, they can afford themselves air-conditioned homes, they have appliances, fridges. But the interesting thing is, almost none of these appliances, none of these cars are actually manufactured in Indonesia. Everybody's buying them from abroad, from China, maybe Europe. They're importing it into Indonesia. And how is Indonesia paying for those imports? It's exporting lots of raw materials. An example is palm oil. You've probably heard about the plantations uh, that are going at the expense of lots of pristine rainforest, also contributing to climate change. But what you probably didn't know is that Indonesia is one of the world's biggest exporters of coal, and coal is one of the most polluting fossil fuels. So Indonesia essentially is exporting climate change. And the really interesting part is that actually Indonesia is not even benefiting that much. Okay, they had nice economic growth, but they're not adding much value to their own natural resources. The added value is happening in, con in countries like China and the United States, where actually the skills exist to add value. So the core problem, again, in Indonesia to modernize its own economy is capacity. The education system just isn't geared up for that. And if Indonesia is not even able to do this in the conventional economy, what will happen if we need to switch to a completely green economy as well? This will have to, have to happen very, very fast. This is not a problem that is unique to Indonesia, unfortunately. It happens in more countries of the world. We need much more human capacity to make this happen. But it's really Indonesia's own business to have the capacity to develop its own economy, right? It's up to them. But it's actually all of our business to develop the skill set to stay below 1.5C. It is in all of our interest to do this. So the conclusion is we should really work on this capacity development together. We need international collaboration to do this. Now back to the Paris Agreement. Actually, the parties, the countries in the Paris Agreement agreed to develop this capacity together. It's in the Paris Agreement. The problem is the countries are not doing it and we are not even holding them to their responsibility. In order to limit warming to 1.5C, we need much more capacity um, in the world. Without that, countries will not develop the, their prosperous and green economies that we need. And our 1.5 degree target will be out of sight in no time, and we now know what that means. So in order to stay below 1.5C, all of us, all of you, should think, change things in your personal lives, but also in your professional lives. Many of you will have international networks. Many of you have jobs that actually matter for this space. You may be teachers, or you may be working in a car factory, or elsewhere. You can do things in your professional life as well to, to make a change. Please ask yourself to do that and share experiences with each other. Talk with each other about what it's like to live in a warming world and what it's like to prevent worse. We can still stay below 1.5C, but we have to build capacity to do that. This will not happen by itself or on its own. We are now at a time that we have the last final half a degree and it's critical for our survival that we make this happen. Thank you.